All right. Well, when you think about, I think, every significant decision that you've ever made in life, or at least every significant decision that you have made as an adult, my guess is that you would agree with me that they all ended up being uh, both harder and better than what you were thinking about. And um, I would apply that to becoming a pastor, to going to grad school, to planting a church. I would apply it to marriage. I would apply it to having kids that all of these different experiences end up being both harder and better than you would imagine, right? In some ways, it's that combination of harder and better that alerts us to the fact that this is a significant decision. This is kind of a milestone decision in our life. And part of the reason they end up feeling a little bit harder is we all tend to over-accentuate the positive on the way in, right? Like, think about what you were doing on your way to move to D.C. You came here to pursue a dream. You came here because you had professional ambitions to make a difference in the world. And yes, you knew that the cost of living was going to be, you know, worse than a lot of other places. But you didn't let that get you down because, man, you were living the dream. You were going to make a difference. But then you get here and you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> Pursuing the dream seems to be, you know, a life of perpetual poverty and traffic and heat, and humidity, and now Canada's on fire, and that's blowing into our city, and we have this sense of like, man, I knew there were going to be sacrifices, I knew there were going to be struggles, I knew there were going to be bad days, but I didn't probably think about those as much as I thought about the good days. That's okay, that's just part of human nature, but even in the moments where we're aware, like, no, I know there's going to be trade-offs, like, I I'm a grown-up, you still get to the point where you're like, yeah, yeah, I knew there were going to be hard days, but I didn't know it was going to feel exactly like this, right? I think, I think about that in terms of parenting, like, you know, by far, best thing Laura and I have ever done, greatest days have come in many ways through the lens of being a parent. And you know that it's going to be hard, but every parent gets to a point, particularly in those first few sleep-deprived months, where you're like, oh, but I didn't think it was going to be this hard. Like, I didn't think I was going to be this desperate for sleep. I didn't know that I would go this many days without showering. Like, I didn't know that it was going to be quite like this. It just hurts a little bit more. Yet... Yeah, we, we all can relate to that with some experience in life, some way, shape, or form. Yet, it's because it's harder that we also look back at the same thing and we're like, oh, but I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Right? But it, it, it's one of the, the best things that I've ever done. It was all worth it in the end. We all, we all understand this harder yet better kind of phenomenon. Um, I think what we are less comfortable talking about is that this harder but better thing also applies to following Jesus, right? Um, I'll just tell you my story. I decided to follow Christ second semester, my junior year of college, and I did it primarily because I was acutely aware that I was in need of forgiveness, acutely aware of my need for a fresh start, and on top of all of that, they seemed to be willing to sweeten the deal by throwing in heaven. And I was like, man, sounds good. Sign me up. I need all of the love, all of the grace, and all of the mercy of God that I could possibly get. And there's nothing wrong with that. We all need the love, the grace, the mercy of God. We all need that forgiveness. We all need that fresh start. We all do want to spend eternity with God when we understand what that really is going to look like. So I'm not taking anything away from that. Like part of what I try to do every single Sunday we come together is to remind us of the truth of the gospel that in Christ you really are fully known and you really are fully loved, right, by the God of the universe. So much so that he sent his son to die in your place on the wood of the cross so that all those things could be possible. That God could know the depth of our wickedness, yet we could be the objects of his love, right? That's true. I'm not taking anything away from that. So that's how I got my start. 
And then I was raised on what you might call a, a steady diet of Bible verses that were around the theme of like, look, in Christ we're more than conquerors. And I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And nothing is impossible with God. And nothing can separate me from the love of God. Again, all true things. All Bible verses and things that we need to hold on to. But... Because I was raised on a steady diet of that, I didn't know what to do when I hit places in my relationship with God where I then had the same sense of like, wait, but I didn't think it would feel like this. Right? Where I would get to places in life where I was like, wait a minute. If all things are possible, why is God asking me to go through this? Right? If we're more than conquerors, why does it feel like so much of my life is crumbling around me? If I've been knit into an eternal spiritual family, why do I feel so alone? Why does it hurt? Why am I confused? Why do I feel more flipped upside down now than I did before I became a follower of Jesus? I was ill-equipped to make sense of that. Right? I, I wasn't expecting those moments because I had an underdeveloped picture of what discipleship to Jesus would actually look like. And in the passage that we're going to look at today, Paul is helping us flesh out our picture of discipleship. And what he's trying to show us is that a significant part of our discipleship to Jesus is going on a journey from pride to humility. And he's saying, hey, fair warning, that journey is going to be both harder and better than you could ever imagine. Right? It's going to lead us to the places that we desperately want to go, but there are going to be moments in our discipleship to Jesus where it's going to be hard, where it would feel like it would be easier to give up on this God stuff, to give up on this church stuff, than to keep going. And what Paul knows is that if we're not prepared for that, when those seasons come, they're going to either throw us for a loop, like it did for me, or they're going to cause us to walk away from the church and from faith altogether as it did to many of my friends. Right? So today is a little bit of Paul preparing us for difficulty in our Christian life, but it's also Paul trying to inspire us and show us that it's going to be worth it. So if you stick with me, I think we'll end up in places that will be deeply encouraging to your soul. What I want to do is just talk about the journey from pride to humility, get us ready for the reality of it, and then make the case that it is both a harder and better journey. You start to see that unfold, the journey itself, in verse 6. Now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things. Um, we've talked a lot over the last couple of weeks as we've worked our way through 1 Corinthians. Paul, to this point, has been extremely concerned about factions and divisions in the Corinthian church. The Christians of Corinth are grabbing on to certain leaders who are advancing a vision of Christianity that they particularly resonate with, and they're like, I'm in that camp, I'm in that tribe, I'm in that denomination, I'm in that stream, I'm with that guy. And Paul has been like, man, you got to stop doing this. It's leading to envy. It's leading to strife. It's trapping you in perpetual spiritual immaturity. But he says, I've been applying these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, right? Over the last couple of weeks, he's been talking a lot about spiritual leadership, and he's been using himself and Apollos, two well-known leaders in Corinth, as like a case study. Now, he's aware that he has been doing that in a way that might suggest that somehow he and Apollos are the problem. Like, you know, they're these leaders that are playing different factions off of each other to gain influence. And that, you know, the real issue here is that Paul and Apollos have an unhealthy view of spiritual leadership. But what he's doing in this passage is he's like, no, 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 look, Apollos and I, we're good right? We're not playing you guys one off the other to increase our following on Twitter or threads or wherever we're following people this week, right? I'm not doing that. He's saying the problem is actually the way you guys 
are imposing your expectations on spiritual leaders. He's essentially been talking about him and Apollos as a way of kind of easing into the topic and blunting the impact of what it is that he really wants to say. But now he's going to turn his attention directly to the Christians of Corinth. And he's saying, I've been doing all of this so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, nothing beyond what is written, the purpose is that none of you will be arrogant, favoring one person over another. And what Paul is doing here is saying, hey, there's actually two purposes. One leads to the other. The first purpose is this little phrase that we read that the Corinthian church would learn the meaning of the phrase, nothing beyond what is written. Right, to which all of us should hit the pause button and be like, wait, what in the world does that phrase mean? Um, which is a really, really, really good question. Um, and I'm going to give you the best possible answer right up front. The best possible answer is, I don't know. I don't know. And you should be leery of anybody who pretends that they know like 100%. Um, because this has confused commentators and scholars for centuries. Here's what I think we could say um, with some certainty about it. The Greek grammar makes it clear um, that the quotes that are up on the screen, those are on purpose. He is quoting something. It is also clear that he is not quoting anything from the Old Testament, nor is he even like approximating something from the Old Testament. Best guess is that he is quoting what would be sort of like a familiar cultural proverb to the Corinthians. This is one of those moments where Paul knows what he's talking about. The Corinthians know what he's talking about, but we are actually a little left out, right? So a uh, cultural proverb, like our, our culture, not a great proverb, uh, but we love to say things like, you do you, right? When I say that, you all know what I mean by that. Imagine somebody reading a transcript of a church service 50 years from now and being like, you do you. What does that even mean? And I'm like, fair question. Um, they're like, that doesn't even seem like possible or a good idea. Like, what is that? Right? They'd be confused. That's kind of what's happening here. Now, that doesn't stress me out tremendously because I think Paul spends the rest of the passage illustrating what he means, but when you look at the illustration of what he means and put some clues together, it seems like what he is trying to communicate is this idea that when it comes to following Jesus, we need to be careful that we don't color outside the lines, that we don't expect more than has been promised, that we don't trust Jesus and the gospel to do things in our lives that Jesus and the gospel never promised that they were going to do. It, it might be something along the lines of like, imagine you go into work tomorrow and your boss sits you down and says, hey, I need to schedule a meeting with so-and-so, but before I schedule the meeting, I need you to do a little bit of research. Here's three questions. You know, you look into these, get back to me, and then I'll take it from there. And you decide um, not only to do the research, but to actually schedule the meeting and not just to schedule the meeting for your boss, but to take it for yourself so that when you come back into your boss's office, you tell her like, look, did the research Church, had the meeting, here's how it went. And by the way, I think you owe me a bonus because I went well above and beyond what you asked me to do. Odds are good that she's probably not going to give you the bonus. She's going to be like, wait a minute, you went well beyond what I was asking you to do because you were trying to get something from me that was well beyond what I intended to give you, right? You, you kind of didn't follow the script. Paul, that's what Paul's saying to the Corinthians. He's like, look, don't take too many liberties with what Jesus is asking you to do. And I think he's applying that to this entire realm of Christian discipleship, right? We're going to talk more about that in a minute. But either way, that first purpose leads directly to the second purpose, right? This journey from pride to humility. The underlying issue in all of this is pride. And what Paul is trying to communicate extremely clearly is you cannot be arrogant and follow Jesus well. That if you are following Jesus well, it will inevitably lead you on a journey from pride to humility. One of the ways that we know we are serious about our discipleship to Jesus is that we find ourselves becoming 
more humble, which sounds great. We're like, okay, good. That's consistent with my vision for life. I would like to be a more humble, a more gracious person. And Paul's like, good, good. Hold on to that. Just know that the journey to get there is going to be harder and better than you ever imagined, right? And going back to the you know, idea of not going beyond what is written, I think he, that is a reference to the journey. I think he's going to start to show us what that journey looks like, what discipleship to Jesus looks like. And he's like, part of the reason it's going to be harder and better is that Jesus is calling us to a new vision for our lives. Verse 8, you are already full. You are already rich. You've begun to reign as kings without us. And I wish you did reign so that we could also reign with you. For I think God has displayed us, the apostles, in last place. Like men condemned to die, we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to people. Right? I know it has been said that sarcasm is the grumpy man's wit. I don't really like that, but I've heard that said. I've even sometimes had that said to me. And that may be true that sarcasm is the grumpy man's wit, but it is also true that Paul is being unmistakably sarcastic in these verses, right? Because, um, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, most of these Corinthian Christians were not wealthy. They were not born to influential families. They did not have political power, right? Yet, they were um, striving after it, just like everybody else in Corinth was. What was different is that these Corinthian Christians had grabbed on to their culture's assessment of the good life, and they had decided that following Jesus was going to be their way of realizing what we could call the Corinthian dream, with the illusion fully intended. Right? This idea of being full, this idea of being rich, this idea of reigning as kings is a way of saying, hey, you are looking for a life of comfort. You're looking for a life of financial prosperity. And you're looking for a life of political power and influence. And somehow you think that following Jesus will necessarily get you there. Right? We talk about this all the time. You can have political power as a Christian. You can have wealth as a Christian. You can experience comfort as a Christian. Right? Those things aren't inherently wrong or sinful. But the mistake we make is when we believe that Jesus is obligated to deliver us to those points. And when we don't experience that, that somehow Jesus is not keeping up his end of the bargain. And he's saying, look, you need a vision for your life that is bigger than the Corinthian dream. Because if all you're doing is living for the Corinthian dream, then your life isn't really going to be different than anyone else's out there. Maybe you just have this vague intent of giving Jesus the glory when you finally reach that dream. Or you realize you can't really get to that dream on your own, so you're going to trust the grace of God to get you there where you could never get in your own strength and your own power. And Paul's like, man, here's what we need to do. We need to separate the Corinthian dream from the gospel call of Jesus. And in some ways, that dichotomy probably explains so much of what has been happening in the American church, not just over the last three years or the last seven years, but probably over the last 30 or 40 years where we've been realizing that for way too long we conflated the American dream and biblical Christianity, and we're like, oh, look, they all lead the same way. Yay, God. Yay, this. Yay, that. And, and we're saying, like, wait a minute. There's nothing wrong with the American dream in its best form. There's nothing wrong with what Lucy said at the beginning of our gathering. But sometimes that culturally informed conception of the good life doesn't look a lot like following Jesus. And part of what we have to wrestle with is which one is setting the vision for your life. When they go in the same direction, fine, great, yay. But what happens when they diverge? Which one wins? That's what Paul wants the Corinthians to think about. And he wants to think about it in really specific terms. 
Scholars may not know what to do with this, you know, go beyond what's written quote, but they know exactly what's going on in verse 9, right? Remember the end of verse 9? We have, God has displayed us, the apostles, in last place, like men condemned to die. We've become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to people. That's a direct reference to what would happen when a Roman general would come back from war, right? Because in the ancient world, you would raise up an army, and you would go out to war, and you know whether you won or lost, there's going to be a lot of casualties, and you were going to come back home, and the question was going to be, okay, you inevitably are going to come back home with fewer troops than you went out with. How do we know that you won? How do we know what happened? How do we know the extent of the victory? What do we know? And Roman generals would come back as the leaders of a victory parade. They would go through many of the arches that still exist in um, Rome today. They would march back into the city in triumph, leading a parade with their surviving troops, with their horses, with their chariots, with their equipment. And then at the end, they would have tribute from whatever territory they'd conquered, a bunch of stuff that they didn't have when they went out to war, but then in the very last place in the parade, there would be conquered soldiers. There would be enemy troops who were unmistakably having the worst day of their life. Not only had they lost, not only had their city or their homeland been conquered, but they had been selected to be brought to Rome as part of the proof that Rome had won. And they were on a one-way journey to the Colosseum where it was just going to be a question of whether the end came at the hand of a gladiator or a lion. That's, that's what was going on. You go through all that and you're like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Paul is saying that Christianity looks more like being the guy at the back of the parade than the guy leading the parade? It looks more like the conquered warrior at the back than the victorious general at the front? Is that, is that what he's trying to say? And yeah, 100%, that's exactly what he's trying to say. And I know they probably didn't include that part at the summer camp where you became a Christian four years running. Um, but it's part of the story. And you're like, really? How's that happen? Well, think about it. The whole story is based on a savior who was paraded through a city, beaten and broken, seemingly defeated, being marched to a death that would become a spectacle for anybody who wanted to watch. And he's like, there's your God. Why do you think you're going to be at the front of the parade? There are, 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 are there moments where we have good days, of course. Are there moments where we feel the fullness of the presence of God? Absolutely. Are there moments where we feel like we are winning? Of course, of course, of course. But when we feel like we're at the back of the parade, it's not a sign that something has gone wrong. It may be a sign that we're really following Jesus, maybe for the first time. Right? So you're like, okay, I get it. Harder, harder. That part is pretty clear. Um, could, we, could we get to the better. Um, I need a little bit of better. Okay, the better is absolutely there. I, I just kind of skipped over it because I wanted you to be really hungry for it, right? Go back to verse 7. For who makes you so superior, right? By the way, um, Paul is implying in that first Christ question that he actually believes Christians are better off than anybody else. This is not a like, who told you you were better, you know, rebuke your pride. He's like, Actually, if you're a Christian, you have advantages over the rest of the world. You really are going to live forever. You really do have the Spirit of God living inside of you. You really are part of this eternal family called the church. Like, yeah, 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 you have some advantages if you are a follower of Jesus. But you didn't earn those. You received those as grace. Nothing that we've done makes us superior. It's all grace from God. What do you have that you didn't receive? If in fact you did receive it, why do you boast as if you hadn't received it? 
Right? Paul is working in verse 7 to stimulate their awareness of grace. And what he's showing is that this journey from pride to humility is also a journey to gratitude. Right? That rather than feeling entitled, rather than feeling puffed up, rather than feeling like we are better than anybody else because of what we have achieved or accomplished or earned or because of the size of our house or our address or the car we drive or any of these things, he's like, no, 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 no. These things that could become prompts to pride, you need to learn how to turn them into a catalyst to gratitude. Right? Pride and gratitude simply cannot coexist in your heart, and they simply can't coexist in your mind. Right? You can be arrogant and mumble a couple of platitudes and be like, oh, thanks. Well, you shouldn't have. Right? But that's not gratitude. Right? Gratitude is the sense that flows from your heart, the sense of enjoyment, this sense of blessing, this sense of even if I'm having one of those days where it feels like I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm still grateful that God is with me and I will fear no evil. And it's a journey to gratitude and it's a journey to love. Paul's convinced that if he can free the church of Corinth from their pride, they'll stop favoring one person over the other. They'll stop using each other and they'll start genuinely loving each other where they'll become less preoccupied with what they can get from each other and how you can help me fulfill my vision for my life and they'll just become more interested in what God is doing in your life and how can I help participate in what God's doing in your life, right? C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, and reflecting on what a humble person would look like, who was commenting on the fact that if you met a humble person, that person would probably not conform to a lot of the imagery that we might have. He said, probably all you would think about this humble person is that he seemed a cheerful, intelligent chap. So much fun to be British. You get to say things like chap. Um, who took a real interest in what you said to him. If you dislike him, it will be because you feel a little envious of anyone who seems to enjoy life so easily. He will not be thinking about humility. He will not be thinking about himself at all. Right? I think all of us want to get to these places of self-forgetfulness, these places where we're able to love others, these places where we are able to walk through the day with a sense of gratitude for the fact that we're alive, there's breath in our lungs, we have the Word of God, a good cup of coffee, and some things to look forward to over the course of the week. We want to be those people. We just think that somehow we can get there with a journey that isn't marked by any suffering. And Paul's like, no, it is a harder but better road, right? If we can buy into that idea, the next pieces of his argument come um, a lot more quickly, right? 1 Corinthians 4, verse 10, we are fools for Christ, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. Bottom line, he's saying, look, this journey from pride to humility, it's not always going to make sense. It will make us live in total dependence on the grace of God. Yeah, there's going to be moments where people think you're weird, where what you're doing doesn't track with their expectations. You just got to get good with all of that. Right? You got to understand that you have a different vision for life. You're after a different dream. You're building to something bigger and better. And if that's the case, you're also going to find a new tolerance for suffering, not an enjoyment of suffering, I don't think Paul particularly enjoyed the difficulty that he experienced, but he was willing to go through things like verse 11 and 12. Up to the present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty. He means those quite literally. We are poorly clothed, roughly treated, homeless. We labor working with our hands, which obviously there's a tremendous value and dignity to that, but in Corinth, being blue collar would have been really looked down on. You know, you were supposed to aspire to be a philosopher and have a bunch of servants and people that took care of all of that stuff for you. Right? Paul is trying to prepare us not just for a conceptual life at the back of the line, but he's trying to prepare us where there are going to be times where we very much feel that we are at the back of the line. 
Right? We don't just pay lip service to the theology and appreciate the you know, Jesus reference of like, oh, right, crucified Savior paraded through the city on the way to death to redeem the world. Oh, yeah, I love that, man. Like He's saying, hey, a lot of your discipleship happens when you actually get treated poorly, when life is difficult, when life is hard, when you don't know where the money is coming to make the rent payment, where you can't figure it out, where you're struggling at work where for the first time in your life you feel like you can't make it all happen. You're not the head of the class anymore. You're not even sure that they're all that happy with what you're doing. In those moments, Paul says, look, that's where you're going to be tempted to bail on Jesus. Don't do it. He's trying to challenge us and to encourage us. Right? He's trying to get us to wrestle with the fact That if you looked at verse 11 and 12 and said that reflected the reality of your life, would you still follow Jesus? That's a hard, hard question. Because I get real uncomfortable if I aim that at me. If that was my story, if I was like, Man, y'all, there's been times this week that I couldn't feed my kids. And I've gone to bed hungry every single night this week. And my kids don't have shoes. And I've been kicked around this week. And Laura and I are super grateful for those of you that are letting us couch surf in your living room. This is just a really, 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 really tough season. How much of that could I endure before I went and found a different job? I don't know. How much of that could we endure before it's like, I don't know. I was praying for the sign that it was time to move back to Florida. I think the time is here. Paul Paul wants us to ask, what are you going to do in that moment? Because he wants us to know that they might very well come. But he also says, hey, if you can stick with it, there is something profoundly encouraging with that. Because here's what it means. It means that Paul, who just, by the way, was born to wealth, born to privilege, born to position, was well-educated, prominent member of a community. He had found something in Jesus that was so beautiful and so compelling that he was like, look, if I have to be at the back of the line to be with God, I'll do it. That's amazing. That fills me with hope. That makes me say, I want that for my life. Whatever it was that Paul found that enabled him to write Philippians 3, 8. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of him, I've suffered the loss of all things and considered them as dung so that I may gain Christ. I've gone from being one of the elites to being at the back of the line, and I'm okay with it. Look, do I want to live every day of my life at the back of the line? No. I like comfort and vacation and a good nap every bit as much as the next guy. But I want to know, what did Paul find that he's like, I'm good. It's worth it. Yep, I I would trade it all. Take the house, take the degrees, take the job, take the four, take it if I get Jesus. That's beautiful to me. That he's like, you can have it all. I get Jesus. Okay, I'm okay. Oh, man, that's what I want for us as a church. Harder, 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 harder. So much better. So much better. I wouldn't trade my life with the Son of God for anything. And if you can get there, then, yeah, you'll have a new response to rejection. Because it's not just that sometimes life is hard. It's sometimes people are hard. Verse 12 to 13, when we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we respond graciously. Even now, we are like, we're treated like the scum of the earth, like everyone's garbage. That's not his self-assessment. He's like, man, that's just sometimes how I feel. You've been there where you feel like people are looking down on you because of your faith, where People thought you were the promising new kid at the job, and then they found out that you take this Jesus stuff a little more seriously than they're comfortable with, and they're like, ooh, okay, you have to rethink you. Times where you have felt reviled by family members. Times where you felt slandered. Times where it's not that life is hard, it's that people are hard. And Paul says, I know. 
But I didn't get into this for comfort, and I didn't get into it for the applause of the crowd, and I didn't get into it for Instagram followers, and I didn't get into it for anything other than my love of God. So sure, if you're going to revile, I'll bless you. All right, when you're going to persecute, I'll keep going. If I'm slandered, I, I can be gracious. You don't have the best opinion of me. That's okay because I know I'm held firm in the arms of God. It's in a sense when we are able to do that, that we know that we're making real progress in our journey with Jesus. Maybe it's that ability to endure when we're being reviled that is the epitome of Christ's likeness. First Peter chapter 2, verse 23, Jesus, when he was insulted, he did not insult in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. He just entrusted himself to the one who judges ju gently, uh, justly. Right? We learn how to endure rejection because we're after something bigger than the applause and approval of other people. All right, so look, at the end of the day, we've got good news and bad news. <laughs> the bad news is there will be moments where following Jesus feels harder than you ever thought it would be. Right? And, and, and part of me wants to like gloss over that. And I'm like, that doesn't serve any of us well, myself included. There's going to be times where it's harder. But those harder times are opening up the door for seasons where you're like, look, it's better than I ever could have imagined. He's leading you to a life of gratitude, of love, of resilience, of purpose, of confidence. Not a confidence that's rooted in yourself, but a confidence that's rooted in him. It's okay, I'm just going to pray that God would do that in our lives. Father, what you are saying in your word is clear. but I would be lying if I didn't say I struggle with it. I'd be lying if I said I readily embraced it. It's a sense of trepidation when we look at what discipleship to Jesus really looks like. And God, I pray that you would help each one of us be real about our concerns and our fears. But I also pray, God, that you wouldn't just leave us in that spot. That you would meet us and carry us to the place where we're able to see the better. We're able to see what Paul saw that allowed him to become content in any and every circumstance. We're able to see what so many throughout church history have seen those who are willing to sacrifice comfort and ease to know you and to make you known in the world. Jesus, we can't do harder if you don't show us better. Would you do it this morning, I pray. In Christ's name, amen.